Good morning, welcome to First Congregational Church of Cape Coral. This is going to be a much quieter service this morning than anticipated because my four grandchildren are not here. Through, through various uh, situations, they cannot get a flight. Their flights have been canceled. And um, we're hoping they make it before Thanksgiving. So we will find out. Lord willing, within the next few days. So um, it will be much, much quieter here this morning. Um, but it's a wonderful joy to be with you. The reign of Christ Sunday. My kingdom, Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. With that, may we stand and sing sanctuary, our introit. You may be seated. For our call to worship this morning, reading responsively, let us praise God for the salvation we have in Christ. Let us thank God for the gift of His Son, who bear humanity and never have shamed humanity. Because of His work, Christ is now exalted, and we are redeemed. Let us join our hearts and voices in prayer. Almighty God, you have given us by grace the salvation we never could earn. Instill in us a sense of dependence upon you. May we no longer rely on our own merits and assets, but learn finally to trust in you. This we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Come, ye thankful people, Come, shall we stand and sing?
be seated. As we come to the reading of God's Word, I want to encourage you to be attentive to the readings. Because my message is far more in story form this morning than it is looking at specific texts. So listen carefully to the scriptures this morning because you will find them throughout the message. Good morning. This Old Testament reading is an addendum to the previous chapter, which is David's song of praise to the Lord, a national thanksgiving for the founding of Israel and its destiny in becoming a great power dedicated to and praising God. Reading from 2 Samuel, chapter 23, verses 1 through 7. David's last words. These are the last words of David the inspired utterance of David, son of Jesse, the utterance of the man exalted by the Most High, the man anointed by the God of Jacob, the hero of Israel's songs. The Spirit of the Lord spoke through me. His word was on my tongue. The God of Israel spoke. The rock of Israel said to me, when one rules over people in righteousness, when he rules in the fear of God. He is like the light of morning at sunrise on a cloudless morning, like the brightness after rain that brings grass from the earth. If my house were not right with God, surely he would not have made me an everlasting covenant, arranged and secured in every part. Surely he would not bring to fruition my salvation and grant me my every desire. But evil men are all to be cast aside like thorns, which are not gathered with the hand. Whoever touches thorns uses a tool of iron or the shaft of a spear. They are burned up where they lie. Here ends the Old Testament reading. A reading from the Psalms this morning is Psalm 132. Reading stanza by stanza responsively. O Lord, remember in David's favor all the hardships he endured. How he swore to the Lord and vowed to the mighty one of Jacob. I will not enter my house or get into my bed. I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling place for the mighty one of Jacob. We heard it in the prophet. We found it in the field of God. Let us go to his dwelling place. Let us worship at his footstool. Rise up, O Lord, and go to your resting place. You in the heart of your might. Let your priests be clothed with righteousness. The Lord swore to David a sure oath from which he will not turn back. One of the sons of your body I will set on your throne. If your sons keep my covenant and my decrees that I shall teach them, their sons also forevermore shall sit on your throne.
its priests I will clothe with salvation, and its faithful will shout for joy. There I will cause a horn to sprout up for David. I have prepared a lamp for my anointed one. His enemies I will clothe with disgrace, but on him his crown will gleam. This beautiful passage begins the book of Revelation. It is written to the seven churches in the province of Asia and comes from the sevenfold spirit. It affirms that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and the ruler of kings. Reading from Revelation chapter 1, verses 4b to 8. Greetings to the seven churches. Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits before his throne and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. Here ends the New Testament lesson. The reading that we heard from Second Saul begins, these are the last words of David, but they really aren't his last words. There are at least 10 last words in the scriptures in the Old Testament. One of them is found in 1 Kings, when David is near death, and gives a charge to Solomon, his son and heir. And the other last words appear in the book of First Chronicles. Today's reading does give us David's synopsis of his reign as king, outlining his accomplishments and his relationship with God. He glorifies God and poses that he has ruled in righteousness and that God has made an everlasting covenant with him. He seems to be characterizing himself as the quintessential king, while evil men are to be eliminated. He is a remarkable king, but he pales in comparison to Christ the king to come, who will be God's perfection. And David, after all, is the archetypal human, as we all are. The messianic prophecies of the Old Testament have yet to be fulfilled. David stumbles and falls many times, as do we all, but as God is always with David, he is also always with us. This is a God who is accessible to us all. We need no king or priest to intercede for us on our behalf. The reading from Revelation gives us the true Christ the King, who has freed us from sins by his blood. He will be visible to everyone, and his kingdom will be dedicated to serving God the Father. We've come to the end of another liturgical year. 
It's been a difficult one, as was the year before it. Drought with fears of COVID and climate change and unrest in so many parts of the world. But this is nothing new. For millennia, men and women have faced all these challenges, as well as many greater ones. Our liturgy is based on the Revised Common Lectionary, which is a three-year cycle of readings, each year beginning with the first Sunday in Advent and ending with Christ the King Sunday, which is today, of course. Next week, we will begin a new liturgical year, once again leading us through Advent, Christmas, Epiphany, Lent, Holy Week, Easter, and the season after Pentecost. During this three-year cycle, we hear the gospel through the writings of Matthew in year one, Mark in year two, Luke in year three, with John's gospel interspersed at various appropriate times. This is our history, from the creation of the world to the ultimate resolution of conflict in Revelation. I love the continuity and predictability of hearing the story, presented differently in each of the three years of the cycle. My knowledge of biblical history and my spiritual growth increase with each yearly cycle. These readings challenge and sustain me and continually strengthen my faith. I eagerly await the arrival of Advent next Sunday. The very word, Advent, was adopted from the Latin Adventus, meaning to the coming or the arrival. I'm ready for the process to begin anew.
Thank you, Helen. Thank you, choir. Our gospel reading this morning is taken from the Gospel of John, chapter 18, beginning with verse 33. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea? Jesus asked. Or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. It was your people and your chief priests who handed you over to me. What is it that you have done? Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you are right in saying I am a king. In fact, for this reason I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify of the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. There ends the reading of the gospel. Let's stand together and sing, Jesus shall reign.
You may be seated. The reign of Christ Sunday. This is new to me. Maggie pointed out this last week that Christ the King Sunday began in the 1920, 1920, which isn't that long ago, really, looking at the lectionary. But it's new to me. From our passages, how do I sum up the reign of Christ Sunday? The resplendent crown never ceases to beckon and dazzle. The resplendent crown. never ceases to beckon and dazzle. Pastor Emeritus Dewey <laughs> believes that the lectionary readings are not only important for God's people, but vital and life-giving and life-changing and transforming. Something that he testifies to, he has witnessed year upon year upon year at two different churches. I concur. He also said this past week, this is the final Sunday of this liturgical year, as Maggie so brilliantly shared with us. For Dewey Good continued this week, this, this is Decision Sunday. The entire year comes to an end this morning. This is Decision Sunday. This is the Sunday where the reign of Christ either is or eh, maybe, someday, we'll see, not sure. This is the day, this is decision day. Who is this king of glory? A psalm just a couple of weeks ago we read, who is this king of glory? The best picture for me personally of who this king is is written in the messenger, the paragraph there, but I will repeat it because I love the story. C.S. Lewis, the scholar, philosopher, theologian, author, British. Did a series, The Chronicles of Narnia. And in the, one of the books, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, we have this scene. Lucy, the youngest of four children, Lucy finds her way mysteriously, very mysteriously, which is a whole nother story, into this world. I am the king but not of this world. She makes her way into this world and is met by a beaver who talks. His name is Mr. Beaver. And Mr. Beaver wants to take him to his home, take her to his home. 
which he does. So Mr. Beaver is a talker, and he tells story upon story upon story, and he talks about this king, this king who actually is a lion. And so after listening to these stories, Lucy Befuddled poses the question, is this king safe? And Mr. Bieber said, safe? Who said anything about safe? He's a lion. Of course he's not safe. But he's good. But he's good. That's King Jesus. It doesn't matter who we look at in Scripture, through the Psalms, through Moses, who is this king? Moses going, who am I supposed to say, hey, you're supposed to do this? Pharaoh? Oh, really? And who told you that? Whether it's Pilate, are you, are you a king? Are you the king of the Jews? The disciples, who is this? The waves, the wind respond to him. The demon-possessed man responds to him. A dead man comes to life. Who is this? You and me. I realized one little sidebar this last week. I realized I wanted to own what I had always talked about with the disciples, how they were so clueless. Oh, Mark, guess what? So were you. <laughs> and I mean that. I said, I, I need to own this. It's truth. The resplendent crown never ceases to beckon and dazzle. So here's the story. And it's just a sketch. It's just a sketch. I haven't studied this episode of history and these personalities that I'm going to speak about much at all. I want to. So it's just a sketch. The year is 1792. 1790, you know Isaac Watts passed away right around then who wrote the last hymn we just sang. Interesting. In 1792, a colony of African slaves moved from Nova Scotia down to Sierra Leone, Africa. A group of Methodist missionaries wanted to experiment. If we take this colony of slaves and place them in a nice area and help them understand how to govern and allow them to learn and have church and just be a community together, they will grow into a healthy community. That was their goal. That was the experiment that they, in reality, did, beginning in 1792. They took a group of African slaves and placed them in Western Africa and said, okay, we're going to do life together. We're going to teach you how to do monetary, all that stuff. For these missionaries, these missionaries had the audacity that all they needed was opportunity. 
they had the capacity, they had the capacity to do life and do it well. They just needed the opportunity. They wanted to give them that opportunity. In 1807, not much longer after that in this community, in 1807, the British Act made slavery illegal. So what happened was those that were to enforce that slavery is now illegal. Are there people behind me? There are. I'm sorry. I thought everyone, and I thought, no, that's not enough. Hi. OK. Eighteen oh seven. How are they going to enforce this? Well, they're going to stop the slave ships. So what? What did they do? They would commandeer a slave ship, and where would they put all these folk in Sierra Leone? So Sierra Leone began to grow, big time, big time, with a lot of different languages. They were throughout Africa. The church, what happened in the church? Fascinating story in Sierra Leone. Because those missionaries, they had this idea. So the church was a vital part of their community. Well, the Nova Scotia, they were both Methodists. Nova Scotia group of Methodists came down. And then a group of Methodists from, and this isn't a slam on Methodists at all. My grand, one of my grandfathers was a Methodist circuit preacher in uh, Wisconsin. It, I lost it for a second. Clam Falls, Wisconsin. Can't even find it on a map. Anyway, it doesn't matter. So I'm not down on Methodist at all. He taught a Sunday school class until he died in his late 70s in a Methodist church. It was packed every Sunday. Fascinating man, wonderful man. Reverend Lester Sund. Okay, back to Methodist. So there's two groups of Methodists. Uh-oh, guess what happened? There were problems. There were a lot of problems. The Nova Scotian Methodists were very strongly Wesleyan, and they had a piety and a love for the king of kings, Jesus the Christ. That's who's king. Uh-oh, you've got the Methodists from Great Britain who now have their own king. And they want to make sure that they understand who this king is, this earthly king. That caused problems on a daily basis, year after year after year after year, with the leadership of the church, the leadership of this colony until the fight just got too much and the whole thing kind of just fell to pieces. When the, when the Methodist group started, there were two that said, we need to translate scripture into the mother tongue of these Africans. So they set on two different languages, and that's what they did for a few years. But then, as the years went on, too many languages, too many people, and the whole idea and concept of translating was put to bed, done, over with. The, that English, English, became the language of the church. Then, in the late 1820s, then Hannah 
Kilman came on the scene. Hannah Kilham is beckoned by the king of kings. And her passion was absolutely not. They will read and learn and know the scripture in their mother tongue. And she was a powerful, powerful woman. In 1830, she published her manifesto, The Claims of West Africa to Christian Instruction in the Native Languages, 1830. That same year, she began an institute to do this very thing in Sierra Leone. She died at sea on March 31st, 1832. What Hannah achieved, and I'm, I'm reading a quote, what Hannah achieved, she had to do herself. Or with a few like-minded friends and helpers, per perhaps she had too many dreams, too many good ideas too many burdens on her conscience. Hannah Kilham died without success or successor. And yet, in a way, she never could have guessed she pointed to the future. For in 1840, everything changed. everything changed. Less than 10 years, a couple of gentlemen come on the scene and they take what those early missionaries had done in translating into two languages and what Hannah had done and brought them together and set out to map the indigenous languages of Africa. And lo and behold, lo and behold, Sierra Leone became the center, the center of evangelism throughout Africa because that's where the mother tongues were learned and the scriptures were translated into those mother tongues. The resplendent crown never ceases to beckon and dazzle. So do you know where these, this colony came from? The Caribbean. The Caribbean. In the late 1700s, these missionaries saw a strong church on one of the islands in the Caribbean and said, let's, let's try this. Let's try this. Let's take them to Nova Scotia, get, figure out what we're going to do, and then find a place and take them down. They had a couple of strong Christian philanthropists who funded the whole project. An experiment. The resplendent crown never ceases to beckon and dazzle. Out of this group, out of this university at Sierra Leone, there was tremendous research done. Did you realize that sociologists and anthropologists were first missionaries? That that's where those entire fields of science came from. And the earliest, the earliest anthropologists in the university in their office never went on the field or rarely went on the field. They just took everything that the missionaries had written and devoured it and came up with these theories. But it was the missionaries living with, oh, become all things to all men so that some might be saved. 
resplendent crown never ceases, never, never ceases to beckon and to dazzle. So, these primitive religions that were so just throughout Africa, language led to what's going on with these religions? And they began to find that there were similarities between all of the different groups throughout Africa. There were differences, but there were similarities. And the similarities led to the universities and those studying stating, quote, the primal religions were the substructure of Christianity. Whoa, wait a second, wait a second. The resplendent king was at work in Africa prior to the gospel ever going there? Sounds like it. In 2007, 2007, and this is my last part of the story. But the story isn't over. It's not over at all. So we go to 2007 with James L. Cox. Recognizing that the primal religions of Africa are found around the globe. Whoa. Paul writes that the law was the schoolmaster for the Jew. It would prepare them for the Messiah. It would lead them to the Messiah. It would lead them to the King of Kings. Today, James Cox, today, 2007, contemporary time, is stating point blank the primal religions found not only in Africa, but in South America, in the Caribbean, throughout the, the islands of the Pacific, in Asia, those primal religions have the form of structure of the Christian faith within them. Worldwide, for centuries, the heavens declare. So when I think about the reign, the kingdom, the king of Christ, alive and well today, I'm astonished. I am astonished. I am dazzled by with what we find in those people's lives, if you spend enough time with them and learn about them and who they are and actually love them. The story is not over by a long shot. In fact, this king was in the beginning, is here today, and will be here tomorrow. The everlasting king. The I am. The resplendent crown. This crown, this king, this kingdom that has this splendor like on that Mount of Transfiguration that puts the three disciples with their faces in the ground freaked out, blown away, completely dazzled, going, what is going on here?
It is no wonder that I am so drawn to Esther Light Capmeek following Michael Polanyi and saying, when you know you have made contact with reality, with the real, with the I am, with truth, you will know that because it opens up to you. It opens up. It doesn't close down. It doesn't close down and go, oh, got that one in my back pocket. No, no. It dazzles. It dazzles. It opens up the universe. Esther likes to say with uh, one of her students that, that came to Christ in college in her teaching, he said, well, what changed? He said, my questions changed. Kind of like Job. My questions changed. They got real different when I met this king, Jesus. When he came into, invaded my life, my world, my questions changed. The resplendent crown never ceases to beckon and dazzle. Father, we thank you. We thank you for this unbelievable, glorious gospel. We thank you in working in people's lives that are able to communicate and help us to understand. your expansive gospel, your powerful gospel, your gospel that brings goodness and delight into this world. May we be responsible to you in everything that we do. Make that so, we pray. Amen. May the ushers come forward for the morning's offering.
Father, thank you for your beauty. Thank you for these gifts, these tithes, these offerings. We give them back to you and ask for you to use them for your honor, for your glory, for your kingdom. For we come in the name of the King of kings and Lord of lords, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Before we move to joys and concerns, I'd like to have Ginger come on up. There is a special offering that we are going to do this morning, and it was it is in the messenger, and it was a it's a story about a local young boy. Come on up, Ginger. And As the chair of the missions group, I gave the letter that I had received to her for her to think about, pray, and talk to the others that were on the committee. And um, that has led to this morning and where we are today. Ginger. Thank you to all of you. Um, this is quite a big decision. Lots of prayer went into it, but this is a little boy. He's two years old. He lives in North Fort Myers with his mother, and his, his um, grandfather is trying to help that they can purchase a van for him. He has, now if I present this, pronounce it correctly, mitochondria and uh, Lehi's syndrome which affects the muscles. He cannot walk, and it's, it affects all the cells, the energy cells in his body. And he goes, makes many trips to the doctor because of this. He has a feeding tube. He cannot speak, um, but he's a happy child. The grandfather is just delighted with this little boy, but they do need some help. and. Um, the van that they need is one with a lift in it, which is very expensive. There has been other fundraisers um, to help them purchase something, if nothing else, because the little boy has to be carried into um, the car, in a car seat, and then she does transfer him to a stroller because he's a little bit heavy. He's a, I think what did she say? He's, um, He's about 40 pounds, and um, it's a little hard for her to transfer him. So their whole theory is that the family does need some help. And this touched my heart because as you all have prayed for my great-grandson, who was a spina bifida baby, and they needed the same thing where they're transporting their child back and forth to doctors and hospitals for surgeries. And, uh, but very fortunately, my grandson was in a position to help get a van that would cart all the equipment he needed. And to this day, now Joshua is eight years old, and he also has a, an adopted sister that's six years old, and they're both spina bifida children. Mm. So this is where my heart went that this was a little boy and this family needs, desperately needs some help. So if you can find it in your heart to donate anything extra, that would be great. If not, please, please keep prayers for the family, for the little boy, for the parents, and for the grandfather. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ginger. With that, will the ushers come forward?
Yeah, you can come forward. Why don't you come forward? What is his name? Jason. 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 Okay. Let's let's pray for Jason. Father, we thank you and we praise you for this grandpa having an idea and sending out a letter to local churches to ask for help for Caden. Father, thank you that you have moved in our hearts to respond, to help. Thank you for that. We commit him into your hands and his mom and ask your blessing upon them. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you. Joys and concerns. I have a joy. You've got joy, 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 I joy down joy, in joy your joy heart. In heart. Uh, I want to thank everybody for uh, last Sunday's uh, uh, honors that were set upon me as Minister Emeritus. I want to thank Maggie and I want to thank Janet and all of you who worked so hard and, and uh, Sharon for, for putting together last Sunday's honors. It's, it's mind boggling to me. And, and then when I got home and opened the card and saw your generosity, it was beyond anything that I could have imagined. And so uh, following Mark's sermon, I, I thought, you know, it is indeed a great joy and an honor to have been welcomed into the primal community of mm. the First Congregational Church, where it's your faith that has sustained me and our faith in God mm. uh, to, to do things like we just did. It's, it's a marvelous and wondrous thing, and I thank God for allowing me to be the, the one who proclaimed the gospel in your midst for 17 years, and I, and I will continue to cherish the time that I spend in this church. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> Amen. Someone else, a joy. I have a joy. Helen's got a joy. Um, it was a joy to have the chimes play today. This is their first time out with their, but yeah. We haven't played, which is a really long time, two years without playing. And, um, and two of our members, Janet and Dewey, this is their first time ever playing chimes. Well, not today, but this year. And so um, they're learning a whole new of how to make music and praise God. And so um, we, we hope to play lots in the coming year. And I want to congratulate them on doing such a great job. Thank you. And Vic, thank you. And I also want to thank um, all the guys and ladies, Bill, uh, Don and Mary and Bill, and I don't know who else was out there cooking hamburgers and hot dogs last yeah. week. But that's a labor of love, and we do appreciate you. Amen. Amen. Someone else. I have a prayer concern. Back home, a very good friend of mine has a granddaughter in her 20s. Her name is Britta, who has suddenly come down with the shingles. And these shingles are in her eyes. And the doctor said they would go through and the girl who has the cancer scare and stuff like that and went through it at six days mm. with a cancer. Mm. 
Thank you. Will do. On a happier note, a very special young lady recently had a happy birthday. Oh. Angela. On the 15th, Angela birthday. And we're going to have um, birthday cake after, and you will be one of our special guests, Angela. We love you. Happy birthday. Yes. Oh, she wants me to reveal. Ice cream. <laughs> Joys and concerns. So, yes, Miss Janet, hang on. Um, pray for Maddie and Ryan as they're trying to um, get tickets to be able to get from California to Florida to yep well, I'm saying it's the evil one that's keeping them away and any so please thank you for praying for Madeline and Ryan and their tickets to get here yeah fascinating Fascinating. <laughs> when, I, when I heard, wait a second, y you can't get a ticket to get here? It's they like, what? Is that what I, not what I said? Yeah. What? Yeah. Well, what's with that anyway? It's in the Lord's hand. It's all going to work out. <laughs> Always does. Don't yes, <laughs> amen. Amen. Ay, ay, ay. Okay. Any any other joys, concerns? Judy. Roger, some exercise. Um, I have some really sad news that um, my best friend, my BFF, who was my BFF before there was a BFF <laughs> um, from high school, uh, just passed away this mm. week. Um, mm. Her name is Steffi, and um, so please be with her family. Uh, she was a delightful, wonderful person, so thank you. Mm. Steffi? Anyone else? Let's go to prayer. Our gracious, gracious Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this church. We thank you for our country. We thank you for the manifold opportunities we have to enrich our lives, to enjoy life. Father, grant that we would have wisdom and discernment
energy and health to pursue those opportunities. I pray especially for Steffi's family and for Judy, that your comfort would be theirs, that you would wrap your arms around them. Father, others within our community of faith that have recently lost loved ones. Be with them, we pray. May your peace abound and your comfort take the pain away. Lord, we lift up young Britta and ask your healing hand to be upon her. Give wisdom to the doctors. Spare her of this illness. Bring her through it. May there be no damage to her eyes, we pray. Thank you for Angela. Thank you for the joy that she brings to my life. Thank you for the joy that she brings to this church. Bless her, we pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for your sacrifice of love in sending your son that we might have life everlasting. Now with one voice, we pray the prayer that our Lord Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So it being Thanksgiving week, we will meet Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock, those that are involved in lectionary readings so that we will briefly go over Advent and each Sunday and who's doing what, where, when. What we're doing for the rest of you that we're, I'm breaking it up and so the individuals who have been reading in the, in the recent past will be taking one Sunday and so we'll have a diversity of individuals up in the pulpit doing the readings through Advent. Wednesday, the Bible study is postponed due to Thanksgiving, and choir has moved from Wednesday evening to Tuesday evening at 7 o'clock. What about Friday and the chimes? You are meeting. You are meeting. Okay? Okay, getting ready, getting ready. I love it. And what? The angel tree is out there with slips of paper for individuals. So make sure that you take your time and take a child, take a child this Christmas and bless them, we pray. And the boxes. They're still out there. And return. and return them. There are some being returned. Thank you. Do you want to come do announcements? I was just wondering. You're doing really good at it. <laughs> I do need help sometimes. You are right. Do you want me to sit down now? 
Helen, did I forget anything else? You haven't signed up for Thanksgiving. Do that today. Okay. Yeah. Sign up for Thanksgiving today if you, if you haven't. Th thanks, Janet and Helen. Janet, over here. Do, have I missed anything else? It's called cloud memory. Cloud memory? Okay. Yeah, okay. That's all right. Remember, my kids can't get here, so it's yeah, that's very unsettling. Sharon. Yes. Um, along with the Thanksgiving sign-up sheet, which is in the narthex and will be over at the social hall afterwards, um, there is also a sign-up sheet for our Christmas party, which will be held at the Three Fishermen, um, and that is on December 11th at 1 o'clock. So if, uh, if you'd like to go, everybody is welcome. Um, please sign up and hope to see you all there. Awesome. Okay. Let's stand for our closing hymn. Crown him with many crowns. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen.